And welcome to Video Game Hangover. I'm Randy Dickinson, and I'm in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Hello, I am DJ Ross. I am in Mountain View, California. Each week on Video Game Hangover, we talk about the games that have been keeping us up at night. This week, that is Stray and X Zodiac. Wait a minute. That's the cat game. It is the game that everybody in the world is playing. Yeah. We played it, too. Well, what a surprise. (laughs) <laughs> we are everybody's and we are in the world are you a cat person i imagine you as more of a dog person are you allowed to play this game <laughs> um uh, yeah i like cats i had a cat once okay um yeah I, they're not my uh, my like first choice animals i would have i would have a cat probably um but uh but sarah's very allergic to them so uh, okay well though yeah. that's no good yeah, and growing up, my mom was very allergic to, so it was never really a consideration. All right. Yeah. How much time did you put into Nintendo Dogs? <laughs> Quite a bit. And there was, um, yeah, excellent. Yeah, excellent. a ton of that. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, no, I like cats. I don't. I you know, if 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 a friend has a cat, if we're visiting somebody's house, I will pet the cat. I like engaging with cats, but uh, they're pretty aloof animals. They're generally not. That's true. Yeah, sort of as engaging as dogs are. Depends how much engagement you want out of your pet. This is true. Yeah, do you want to live independently or, um, yeah, I uh, no, I tend to be tend to be a, a very much a dog person. Okay. All right. Yeah, but I'm I'm a dog person who's not opposed to cat people. Got it. I'm not one of those. There are two types of people in the world. <laughs> okay. Kind of people. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> Sounds insufferable. Freedom of choice. Um, you? I, are you? You don't have any pets currently. Have you had pets? I don't have any in, pets. In, no, in I've, your I've life? never yeah. had uh, <laughs> anything with more legs than a fish. No. <laughs> Was it like a family choice? Was there a deep-seated reason for that? Uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I maybe we just didn't have a strong desire to actually have uh, you know. Cat or dog? Not really sure. Yeah. Have not uh, really analyzed this. No. You mention it. <laughs> I had a lot of goldfish and hamsters and things like that growing up. That was a that was about the speed of pet that I, I I could could do with my mom and her allergies. So. Oh yeah. Oh, you know what? Yeah. As a kid, I had real bad cat allergies, so that <laughs> that's probably why. You know, that ah, there you go. It's probably uh, you know it's a very good reason for that. You're the problem then. I was the problem. I was just like, why wouldn't I have had a cat? Oh, right. Yeah. I was never really into dogs until we got a dog. And I didn't get a dog until I was an adult. So that, oh. um, yeah, it was a bit of a late bloomer when it came to that. I was kind of freaked out by dogs a lot. Like <laughs> I found uh, growing up that a lot of the dogs that I encountered were bigger than I was prepared for or were like very aggressive yeah. or like in my space. Um, so, I think I had kind of the same thing when I was a little kid. I wasn't a huge fan of uh, large dogs. But, yeah. uh, you know, when you're small, dogs are much larger relative to you. Sure. So, yeah, yeah I can see how it would actually be kind of terrifying. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, when, I, when we, we grew up and got a dog. And it was a cool dog. She was smart and chill and knew stuff and could do tricks and was super into me. So <laughs> that was fun. That was nice. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I became a dog person. But still, you're you've like mostly had kind of dogs on the smaller end of the spectrum, so yeah. still not really into the big dogs. True. Yeah, I've never had anything bigger than like fifteen pounds, sixteen pounds. Okay, I mean that's so. practically a cat already. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yes, I've heard that joke before, but um, yeah, yeah, it's true. I uh, I, I find that yeah, I have friends that have bigger dogs, and I, I still tend to be a little like, oh my god, what do I do with it? What <laughs> what what is it doing right now? Should I talk to it? Should I pet it? Yeah. Um, will it bite me? That's the big question. Um, <laughs> it's it yeah. more of a concern. 
Yeah. And they generally don't have those concerns with small dogs. So, um, yeah, I tend to be a little, uh, maybe unnecessarily cautious around bigger dogs. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's probably smart. Yeah. For the small dog, if they bite you, it's a it's much smaller chunk of you that goes missing. It's survivable, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 I do. I, I appreciate the like little kids. Well, if we're out with Roscoe or any of our, we've had a, a few dogs. We tend to adopt older dogs. So we don't, we don't get decades and decades with them. So we, we tend to have a lot of turnover, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, um, yeah, if we're out in public somewhere with the dogs and a little kid will come up and say, may I please pet your dog? Oh, well, how nice of them. Yeah. And I'm like, excellent, because sometimes you go places where it's kids just sort of sticking their hands in your dog's face. Uh, And I'm like, someday you're going to pick the wrong dog, kid. Um, (laughs) Yeah, that's probably not a good idea. Yeah. So we really love the kids that are like, may I pet your dog? (laughs) Uh, And are very sort of respectful and slow about it. Because, you know, I've had dogs in the past who are like, yes, but you can only pet her head or don't pet her backside or, you know, things like that. Dogs have preferences about how they like to be approached and how they like to be pet. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I never know what to do with the little kids. Well, I, I know exactly what to do with the little kids who want to aggressively pet my dogs. I'm like, nope, you're good. Take a hike. <laughs> yeah. We had somebody, we went, to, we went to, uh, like a little music fest. I'm, we're doing dog stories now. If anyone's, uh, just tuning in, um, <laughs> a little at a, like a music fest kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, it was dog friendly. So we brought Roscoe and he's, well, he's, he's cranky. He's 15. He's a bit of a grumpy old man. Uh, he's not the most social, um, never really aggressive or anything like that, but is pretty good at sort of communicating his limits. Um, mm-hmm. And like unprovoked, somebody walked up to him and like picked him up. Ah, Yeah, like scooped him off the ground. And I was like, this is not going to go well for you. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I need you to put my dog down right now. Uh, yeah. Was, uh, so yeah, people are weird. People are strange about how they just approach, you know, strange animals. So don't be like that. Be cool. Be respectful. Yeah, that seems, well, that's not cool. Yeah. And this person was an adult. This was not a little kid, so. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, if they're picking up a dog, even if it is a small dog. Yeah. Huh. But, yeah. I mean, really, you only have to get bit once before that, you know, you don't do that again. Yeah. I don't think that would have even occurred to me. Just be like, oh, there's a dog or other small animal. I'm going to (laughs) go pick it up. Yeah. We were out walking one time and somebody was like, oh, may I pet your dog? And we were like, yes. And she sat down like on the sidewalk cross-legged. <laughs> I was like, oh, you're, one, you're, you're a very cool dog person. <laughs> like you get down to their level, man. Like, yeah, I'm into you. You're exactly the kind of dog energy I like. I didn't realize that was a thing. It sounded like they were like digging in. She was going to be hanging out with the dog the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, we always joke. We're sort, of, we're sort of like, okay, we'll be back here about four hours if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get you take it from here. His name is Roscoe. He likes treats. Nice. Oh uh, yeah. So yeah, I like uh, in general. I, I I like all animals, but I I'm I still like go to like uh what is it? There's like farm rescues and things like that. And I'm like, well, that's a big one. I don't know if I need to go near that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anything you can put a saddle on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's an there's an animal rescue not far from us that has like a zebra and a camel, and I'm like, no, I'm good. Oh, oh <laughs> you right. rescue you take home a zebra. Yeah, Is I mean, I'll legal? check them out. I'll look at them. I'll donate, um, you know, to help feed them. But I don't need to like pet it or run around with it or anything. Um, that seems you know, like is it legal. You can't just. I hope it's legal. Well, I mean, I have no idea. I'm just trying yeah. to think. That it doesn't seem like you just casually adopt a zebra. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure what their thing is. It started off as like a dog rescue. It was a pit bull rescue, in fact. Um, and then and they just worked know, their way up to zebras within a few years. Yeah, How they had even, a camel. Like, what was a zebra doing there? What is zebra? Did they come and a bunch from? of goats and stuff. And yeah, I don't know. Huh. Nah, not well, sure. I have questions. Yeah, I mean, they run a very like a you know a very um, I think a responsible operation. They're they're they you know it's a big big thing and they do a lot of donations and have volunteers and they're kind of a big deal in central Pennsylvania. So yeah, I suspect someone has vetted them and make sure that everything they're doing is legal. Well, I mean, I'm not saying they stole a zebra from somewhere, but like zebras don't just, they're just running wild in Pennsylvania, I assume. Yeah. Like it must have come from somewhere. We have a lot of really, I think, kind of kind of archaic animal rights laws in Pennsylvania. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, um, there's a lot of, uh, I'm going to go down a weird little detour here. There's a lot of Amish uh, <laughs> people, little enclaves oh, in Pennsylvania. Okay. Well, say no yeah. more. That completely yeah. explains the zebra. And they, well, no, I mean, they have pretty um, archaic, uh, I don't know, thoughts on how animals fit into people's lives. So yeah, I think we we've we've ended up with a lot of like little petting zoos and roadside attractions and horrible shit like that that is not cool to mm. like keep a bear locked in a cage for its entire life mm-hmm. um, uh, in Pennsylvania because there's historically not been a lot of laws of, of sort of in defense of those kinds of animals. Um, so yeah, that has gotten better over the last couple of years because of you know, like smart rescues that do a lot of lobbying and progressive candidates finally getting into good. <laughs> roles in the government and things like that but uh yeah there's still a lot of occasional weirdness we'll we'll be driving through the woods somewhere uh in a, a deep dark corner of pennsylvania and there's like you know a exotic animal petting zoo and i'm like that's probably not cool <laughs> okay well see it's starting to make more sense now yeah so i suspect probably one of those went out of business or was uh, asked to sort of render their animal or something like that and that's how you end up with a zebra oh Maybe if somebody's in the market for a zebra, or they're just, you know, always wanted one. Now they're, they're ready to adopt, help it out a little bit. They know where to go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hit me up. I, I won't, uh, I don't know. Should I plug the uh, rescue? Probably not. They didn't pay for the advertising. So. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. I know where you can get a zebra. All right. Man, that would not even have occurred to me. Uh, I was just like, oh, here I am trying to decide between what type of cat or dog i should have been thinking a lot bigger <laughs> people are leveling up yeah people have gone beyond uh, cats and dogs yeah no i think that's uh it's out of my uh not range but just a little professional handle the zebras yeah yeah it's cool that organizations like that exist um yeah, uh, uh, yeah i'm very much on the side of uh, uh i don't know <laughs> you should have like you know, fresh water and, and shade and, and, you know, resources to take care of a large giant exotic animal in a place where that animal doesn't sort of generally live naturally. Uh, and if you yeah. can't, hopefully there are rescues that can step in and, and help make sure that that critter has a, a good life. I mean, it have to be an indoor zebra because <laughs> yeah, I definitely don't have space for it to run around, but maybe, yeah, you know, yeah. maybe it'd be chill. Maybe it just wants to hang out on the couch and do indoor zebra things. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put in a good word for you, DJ. Okay, good, good. No, no, I don't want a zebra. I wouldn't appreciate <laughs> it. it would, the zebra would be wasted on me. No. Oh. Black with white stripes or white with black stripes? I think they're white with black stripes, right? Is that the consensus? I'm not sure where I stand on that. I, I That's my understanding. I've not done the research. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll never know. Yep. Unless you adopt a zebra and find out. Right, right, exactly. I'll just drive over and ask him. Yeah. Anyway, now that we're 13 minutes into this thing. We have segued in a pretty significant way with, a, um, yeah. I'm just going to apologize, but screw it. It's my podcast. I can talk about whatever I want. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> we do another 45 minutes talking about Let's do it. Yeah. black or white. We'll save we'll that for next week. Every dog I've ever met in my life. Okay, well. I have a Google Doc. I can walk you through it. You Okay, well, no, I, I, I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah but we did play stray stray is the cat game that a lot of people really like uh and we'll be talking about that this week and we'll talk about uh exodiac and i have no idea what that is yeah well so that's the zebra game it'll be a surprise to me as well as our listeners <laughs> should we uh should we mention the backlog attack coming up we should that's probably Still a good idea. yeah, yeah that is coming up soon that's imminent yeah, so in uh, in roughly two weeks, like a week and a half from when the show comes out, if I my understanding of the passage of time is correct, <laughs> kicking off this year's backlog attack, in which we will be, uh, Randy and I will both be selecting four games from our backlog to try and get through during the month of August. So that's one thing. That's going to be a lot of fun. But also, we're inviting members of the community, uh, VG Hangover listeners, to also select four games that they plan to complete during the backlog attack. Um, and then the, the, how do we describe this? The winner, the person <laughs> whoever accomplishes the most impressive feat of backloggery, mm-hmm. will be rewarded with the new release game of their choice. Yeah. 
So that's coming up very soon. Uh, if you're listening to this a little bit later, maybe not the day it comes out. Maybe uh, it's coming up very, very soon. But there'll be more information on the website at vghammer.com. You can get all the information on how to submit your list of games that you plan to complete and just other details on how to participate. But uh, we're really looking forward to that, hoping to see a, uh, a wide variety of weird games people are getting back into. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we'll be dedicating much of uh, the month of August to the backlog attack. So, um, you know, uh, we would love for you to play along with us, dig into some games in your backlog. Uh, if, if, man, if you're one of those amazing human beings who doesn't have a video game backlog, I, I don't even, I can't even wrap my brain around that concept. <laughs> How does that happen? Um, but uh, yeah, continue to uh, listen along. We, we um, yeah, we'll be digging into some weird stuff out of our own personal catalog. So, yeah. Yeah. One year, I mean, it's not always games that I just had sitting around. I think one year I did games I always sort of wished I had played. So I may have actually added onto my backlog that summer. <laughs> I try really hard to not buy new games to put in my backlog. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I guess I was just that curious about the original Tomb Raider. Yeah. But, you know, if, if that sounds like something that would be interesting to you, then go for it. But yeah. anyway. Check back at vghangover.com. There'll be a post there with more information. Yep. Um, so we should talk about, we want to talk about Exodiac first? You want to get that out of the way or you want to do Stray? Uh, well, before I get into either of these, I have some sad news this week. Oh, no. Which is as of Monday. No, it is Monday. As of Sunday, Dragalia Lost released its final story chapter. Oh. And uh, so not that game has essentially wrapped up um i had talked about this a few months ago when they announced that uh they would be wrapping up the story and eventually sort of uh end of lifing the game so that they were gonna probably gonna take it offline at some point but man it's just been a roller coaster with this thing this is the nintendo mobile gotcha game like kind of action rpg that i've been playing actually pretty regularly since it came out kind of dropped off when they announced they were going to be shutting it down. But mm -hmm. I've been keeping up with sort of the community's reaction to things, and, and it is not a happy time in the Dragalia Lost community this week. Aww. I got to the last chapter of the story, and it was a impressive ending for what seems like kind of a humble like little mobile game. But uh, very bittersweet to see it come to an end. People are uh, seem to be very, very invested in this game. I'm not just talking about the they spent thousands and thousands of dollars spinning the slot machine, but they're just really into the, you know, the characters and the story that they've developed over the last few years. So uh, it's kind of sad to see that it is just coming to an end or has come to an end. Has Nintendo committed to um, how long they're going to continue to support the game from this point forward? And by support, I don't mean sort of new content and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but how long it, I, it's mobile, so I assume there's a, a, a component of this that requires you being online or connected to a cell signal. Um, yeah, so that's still up in the air. They have not okay. released any news or details specifically, but somebody in the community has already data mined that uh, there's a schedule of events, like event reruns planned through November of this year. So the new theory is that they're probably, I mean, if they're going to shut it down, it seems like that would happen at, like around December at the earliest. But it's kind of a, just a weird thing in games because, I mean, games get shut down all the time. But none of the games that I've been involved with have gotten the uh, the announcement that, like, oh, yeah, we're you know just going to be pulling the plug on this thing. It's always a few years after I feel like the community has moved on from stuff. And in Dragalia Lost's case, it feels like, you know, a lot of people are still very involved with this. So it was kind of sad circumstances. Yeah. And I mean, all the more surprising to sort of say, OK, we have new content coming out and then afterwards we're going to shut it down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Well, it seems like, well, well maybe they'll, they'll let a few months go by with no updates and then you sort of like let it slip that, oh, yeah, we're, we're not supporting the game anymore. Yeah. And I think it was like people saw the writing on the wall because the the amount of content coming out had been on the decline. Oh, uh, gotcha. But uh, yeah, it's always you know painful to to actually see the the evidence that you know this is going to be the final story update, while your characters are kind of wrapping up their arcs and all that, and then from here it's just going to be reruns for the next few months. Hmm. 
So you really got into this kind of early and have stuck with it, like you said, until fairly recently. Gotcha games are not rare. So what kept you sort of going with this one? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I felt like, yeah, I was really into just the aesthetics of it because it looked like it looked like an old PS1 or PS2 action game. That was fun. The mechanics were, or just the gameplay, I guess, was interesting enough to uh, sort of keep me fighting the, the boss battles or whatever they would turn out every few weeks. Uh, and also, this is especially um, noticeable as I've been getting in more and more into the Hatsune Miku gacha game, is that they were very generous with the amount of like free gems and uh, you know gacha pulls that they would hand out to people. To the point where, you know, I didn't find it really necessary to spend a lot of money on it to keep it going or to like keep up, yeah. like keep my teams powered up and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think, you know, the community definitely appreciated. You're finding the Hatsune Miku one tends to be a, a little more stingy about those it's things? A, it's a little stingy. Yeah. I was just <laughs> like, oh man, I'm out of crystals again. What do I do now? Hmm. But uh, hmm. I don't know. I don't know what the reason for that was. I don't know if that was like a decision Nintendo made because. I feel like on you know on some level, gotcha games are a little predatory. So maybe I mean <laughs> maybe this is me being very optimistic, giving Nintendo a lot of benefit of the doubt. But uh, I feel like maybe they were just looking out for their their younger fans who are maybe more susceptible to pulling the slot machine one too many times. <laughs> but uh, yeah, kind of uh, the end of an era. I don't know how many people are actually still playing this game out there, but. And it just makes me think, like when when the day comes that they shut down something like Final Fantasy, it's gonna I'm gonna be a mess. <laughs> this is not gonna be a good weekend. <laughs> Have you uh, dipped into the little batch of final content here at all? Or will you be sort of uh, uh, closing it out with everyone else? Oh, I finished the story. Oh, I you did? Through, okay. Yeah, I got through the last boss. I was like, man, I kind of dropped off really closely following the story for a while. So for me, it was a little bit. Uh, just trying to get caught up at the last minute, be like, oh, who are, who are all these characters? Oh, who's this guy? He looks kind of evil. But I think I more or less got the gist of it. I'm sure, there's some real hardcore Dragalia Lost fans just <laughs> rolling their eyes at this point. But uh, right, yeah. I imagine if you were really closely following this from the beginning and you were really invested from the story, this uh, I saw some very emotional reactions on the subreddit after this update came out. And I was just like, oh, man, no, nah, I, I get you. I can see where you're coming from. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, this is, this is rare for Nintendo's kind of forays into mobile because most of them have been based on kind of pre-existing Nintendo licenses. And this was, correct me if I'm wrong, this was unique because it was. Yeah, this was, this was a new thing for them. For mobile. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see if if it ends up being a Switch game at some point, if if this world or these characters or this thing maybe not necessarily in this format, uh, uh, ultimately gets turned into a, a Nintendo property and, and lives on the consoles. Yeah. The community was lobbying real hard at one point for one of the characters in this to be announced as a Smash character. Oh. And I was like, well, that would be a cool way to you know get a little more exposure for these guys. But yeah. also couldn't really see it happening. But uh, hey, you never know with those things. Anyway, yeah. condolences to the Dragalia community. I do hope that they, you know, keep the IP alive in some other form, whether it's they uh, put out an like an offline mode update for this game, or they announce a sequel for the Switch or something. I don't know. Who knows what could happen? Huh. Yeah, it's a bummer. I don't think I've ever played a game. I mean, I, I have games in my, you know. A collection that I still have like discs of that no longer work because they turned off the servers, but I've never, you know, I've done a service game or something like that. That is was twilighted or shut down. I don't think I've ever gotten to the kind of the, yeah. the end of a game's life. Yeah, I was just thinking like for Animal Crossing, it's not like you need to be connected online to play the game. Like at some point, they'll just stop releasing updates for it. Yes. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. Hmm. Okay, well, it's a bummer. Yeah, yeah. My condolences. My condolences. Anyway. More time for Hatsune Miku. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I, I kind of dropped off this game, uh, and that has given me much more time to sink into uh, other gacha <laughs> games out there. But anyway, uh, we talked about that. 
we yeah. should talk about Stray, probably. Yeah. So, um, for listeners who maybe have been living under a rock, <laughs> um, uh, Stray is a new game for PlayStation and PC, right? I believe. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, where, uh, oddly enough, you play as a stray cat um, who gets separated from their little cat family. Uh, and uh, you're working real hard to get back to them, but it does require you to explore and solve some problems for robots. For, for robots, yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking, like, what is what defines something as a stray cat? Like, is the cat in this actually a stray cat? Uh, he's not somebody's pet. Is that is that the is that all it means? You don't uh, you're not somebody's pet. That's, uh, yeah, I think that's my understanding of what a stray is. I usually think of like okay. a stray as like a, like an alley cat, like a, like a, yeah. Sure. He's not okay. somebody's okay. sort of pet companion. This is a, this is a feral cat. It's not a pet. Yeah. I was just yeah. thinking like at the beginning of this game, the cat seems like it is part of, uh, I don't know if it's a family, but definitely, you know, a little group of cats that just hang out. Yeah. Um, Living the life, and then yeah, they get separated, and uh, and and your cat finds. Uh, did they ever name the cat? Did the cat get a name ever? No, I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. Um, and yeah, the cat, the cat finds speak himself English. He does not. Although everybody talks to him like he does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. The so he f- finds himself uh, in a in a mysterious place um, that looks like, uh, um, yeah, kind of like a uh, like a. I don't know, uh, a cyberpunk sort of Japanese-esque kind of um, village where, uh, uh, yeah, all the humans have been replaced by, um, well, not replaced by, I guess, <laughs> rather than it being occupied by humans, it is occupied by uh, robots. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I heard that the the city in this was based on, um, what is it, the Kowloon Walled City uh, in China, which I think... Mm, I think no longer exists. No, oh. but that uh, you know the very dense buildings and uh, narrow alleyways. I mean, it looks like a lot of other sort of uh, mega cities in yeah. Asia. But yeah, you you you. Uh, yeah, I feel like your motivation as a as as a stray cat is to get back to your little uh, collective of cats to get back to your cat family, um, and uh, that requires you sort of getting out of the place that you have uh, uh, been whisked away to and. Uh, yeah, so along the way, you meet a bunch of different robots who are, are equally motivated to get out of the place that they're in uh, and want to help you. And because you're little and agile and quick, um, they give you a lot of little missions and a lot of little tasks to solve. Um, and uh, yeah, you run around and do things, uh, collect things, uh, solve, you know, pretty mild puzzles, uh, run a lot of errands for people, um, do a ton of exploration uh, which is fun, again, because you're little and small and pretty agile. You can kind of get all over the place. So there's a lot of verticality and a lot of getting around. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah. And um, yeah, without getting into uh, spoiler territory, and it would be pretty easy to spoil, I think, some of the big surprises in this, which um, uh, I, I don't intend to do. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's a, it's kind of a, a satisfying mystery. And there's a lot of uh, um, eventual slow exposition about like, why is it robots and how did we get here and what's happening right now? Mm-hmm. And et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I'm trying to think some of the, the trailers. There's also, there's also an enemy. There's also like a mysterious, very aggressive little monster that kind of chases you around sometimes. And there's a lot of them. And where do they come from and why are they here and how do you defeat them, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different kind of objectives and stress points and, 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 you know, mysteries for this little cat to solve. Yeah. I found during the first couple hours I was playing this, I mean, the first half hour was amazing because how many games you get to play as a cat. Right. With, uh, you know, you have like a meow button and you can... (laughs) You can do kind of cat thing like scratch on walls and stuff like that. So yeah. that was delightful. Yeah. But then I, find, the, like, I love that anytime you find like a piece of furniture, you can just claw the hell out of it. Or yeah. anytime there's a rug on the floor, you can kind of do the arch back cat thing and you kind of make muffins and knead the rug. Yeah. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, somebody, somebody gets all the cat stuff. Well, I was thinking like, do they though? Because for the <laughs> next couple hours, I was just like, well, 
I was expecting this to be more of a cat game. I was expecting like untitled goose game, but you're a cat. Oh, because <laughs> in that game, yeah. it, you're very much a goose. Yeah. And you're doing goose things. But in this, it's like more or less incidental that you are a cat. It's like you are playing kind of a uh, 3D adventure game. And it just so happens that you are also a cat. Like the, one of the characters in this game is a cat. Uh, and it felt less necessary to, uh, I don't know, just the how the game progresses. Yeah. Yeah, as a uh, um as a cat I in this you are highly agreeable and very motivated and um super compliant and agreeable in a way that I generally don't associate cats with being. I tend to think they're mm. a little more independent and a little more um you know, maybe lazy. Maybe I've not been around super motivated cats before. <laughs> you know, just chubby house cats for the most part and uh Yeah. Yeah. This cat seems very driven and uh <laughs> Motivated yeah. is a good way of describing it, because yeah, I definitely had that thought playing this. I was just like, well, if I was playing a, a more authentic cat, I don't think I would be doing any of this. <laughs> you're really just like, you know, doing errands for these robots. Yeah, yeah. And you're super agreeable to it. Like, you know, y there are options in the game for you to just sort of like laze the day away if you want to. And I like that <laughs> yeah. it sort of indulges yeah. those. So you you can find a little you know, pile of pillows and push triangle and the music will swell and the camera will pan back and it'll just let you sleep as long as you want to. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I appreciate that that's in there that you can do a lot of destruction as well. There's a lot of little things like on the edge of shelves or on the tops of buildings where you can go up to and you get a little prompt and you kind of, your little cat hand goes and kind of just, yeah, just like off the side. <laughs> push like, cups off tables. All that. Good yeah. Stuff. That's the behavior I expect from a cat. That's exactly yeah. It. Yeah. That kind of stuff pops up often enough and that was those were probably the most exciting points to me in the first couple of hours because i was like oh yeah this is something a cat would do that <laughs> like i would definitely push something off a table for no reason and you, you know most of the time when you have the opportunity in this to do that there is no reason for you to do it so you are just doing that because it's something you have decided you need to do right yeah you and then a there's, a, little... there's a part where you um like somebody is urgently trying to send you a message via computer yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I forget what else is going on. Like I think you yeah. just listen to the message come in, but you uh, there. It feels like they're expecting a response, and a way you. Uh, I guess the way you respond to it is you can walk the cat across a keyboard, and it just you know <laughs> dumps a bunch of keyboard smash onto the uh, the computer. It's like oh, yeah, that's <laughs> another cat thing. Yeah. Yes. Did you um um did you find the people playing a board game together? Oh yeah. No, I was. Yes, I, yeah. I saw that and I was like, yep. okay. So it, I yeah, hope yes, this is going to play out like <laughs> I expect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and players, uh, and listeners, if you've not played Stray yet, definitely um, you, you want to find the people playing a board game because that's a good time. Yeah. So that was good. Yeah. But it turns out the the rest of the game is much less sort of cat centric than I was expecting. Yeah. Uh, and it, I was a little disappointed, honestly, in the first couple hours. But once I sort of moved past that, once I just accepted that this was like, uh, it's not quite like inside or, you know, that type of puzzle game, but struggling to come up with a, another comparison for, you know, just yeah. you being in a, an environment. Oh, you know, I heard someone describe it as like eco, where you're just in this big mysterious environment and solving you know puzzles to progress and i thought okay that's actually a pretty pretty good comparison hmm. so i kind of made my peace with it like okay this is just a different type of game than i was expecting yeah i am um, i don't know i think I, I briefly kind of went through a little like uh why, why does it have to be a cat <laughs> like mm -hmm. this cat does an awful lot of dog things why isn't it not a dog <laughs> <laughs> like um because I, I, I again maybe as a dog owner i'm biased but i generally think of of dogs mm -hmm. as being much more eager to please and much more like collaborative and, and et cetera et cetera so this cat sort of exhibits a lot of uh dog behavior i think <laughs> in stray um but um yeah i don't know it, it, it is weird because you yeah um, you're driven, but it seems like you, you lose the plot pretty quickly as a cat. Like, you know, in the early minutes of it, the early hour of it, you're you're sort of thinking, she's I got to get back to my cat family. But then it just sort of becomes this whole other thing. Like you mm -hmm. get embroiled in all of these. This is where it becomes sort of surprisingly kind of character driven. 
like all of the little robots that you interact with have, uh, you know, for the most part, kind of interesting backstories and, and, and relationships and things like that, that you get a lot of exposition on. Um, you have a little robot companion, a little drone that flies around with you and, you know, translates things and, and hacks computers for you because you're a cat. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, uh, that even has a ton of character exposition <laughs> and has lots of memories that you unlock and things like that. And I'm like, eh. It's not really about a cat. It's really about like a lot of robots who live in a mysterious place and why are yeah. they there? Yeah, it's yeah. mostly about the robots. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be um, a stray cat game, but I think it's probably brilliant marketing that it is. Yeah, because most of the folks are coming at it like I did going, I'm going to play the cat game. Sure, um, sure. Yeah. Whereas if I was, you know, I don't know, pick a thing. <laughs> If this was a untitled frog game, I don't know if anybody would have been nearly <laughs> as excited about it. I would play a frog game. I mean, yeah, I mean, no disrespect. No shortage sure of frog know. games this we've sure. covered. Yeah, but um, but yeah, it is. Um, that said, though, I, all of that said, uh, I really had a good time with this. I'm <laughs> really quite enjoyed it. I think, um, one, it's beautiful. I, like, oh it's yeah, super like densely assembled. Um, um, so this gorgeous depiction of, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a society that's kind of falling apart. It's kind of post-apocalyptic, but in a kind of beautiful way, um, the environments are super dense with a ton of stuff to kind of find and explore. It's not really a collect-a-thon. I think smartly it sort of resists the urges to like, oh, find a hundred of this thing. Um, but there are things to sort of sneak out, uh, seek out and and sort of find little secrets and things that you can collect for robots that give you little missions and stuff. So yeah, I think it's, uh, um, I, I, I don't have a sense of what the size of the development team is or how many people have worked on this, but it feels like a pretty substantial accomplishment for what is an independent game developer? <laughs> uh, yeah, I always, yeah. I have questions about that because yeah, I, I was surprised by the, just the amount of detail in the environment and just like the density of things. Yeah, yeah, and also just like you know the in general the art direction is incredible. There's just so much color and really interesting lighting all over the place. Whether you're in the city or you're in one of the less sort of uh, active environments. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it just looks great no matter what's going on. Yeah. Although I couldn't help but thinking, especially like um, later in the game, you get to some more uh, sort of bustling environments. I'm just like, oh man, this just feels expensive now. Like <laughs> how many artists did they have to bring in to you know, create all these art assets and everything and you know texture these walls and stuff like that. But I don't play a lot of games that are like really on the, on the cutting edge of graphical fidelity. So maybe that's just, uh, maybe that's just me. I'm just like, oh man, games look really good these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pretty big chasm between, you know, a lot of the fun Nintendo eShop oddities that I sort of play sometimes and, you know, recently getting back into God of War going, holy shit, this game. <laughs> like, <laughs> how how do you make games that look like this? I just can't even wrap my brain around like the the hours of work that must go into making that happen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, to look at something like Stray, which sort of exists, like this is not God of War and this is not, um, uh, time on Frog Island, you know what I mean? So it is some weird place in between those two extremes, um, mm-hmm. that, uh, that still has produced this thing that is super playable and, um, uh, uh gorgeous and clearly has been sort of labored over and polished the hell out of, um, so yeah, it's, uh, um, yeah, I have a lot of questions about like how many people and how much money. Like, yeah, um, yeah. Not not that I'm you know suspicious or <laughs> or, or dubious or anything, but you know it's just uh, um, most indie games don't look or play like this. Yeah, no, it was definitely like a level of polish beyond what I was expecting from uh, yeah. sort of what I understood of the history of this game. Uh, I think if I had one complaint about it. Besides, they're just not being not being cat centric enough, but the, <laughs> I, I'm past that. It's that there is so much dialogue between like the different robots and your little robot buddy. Like early on, um, like from when this game was announced up to the point where you actually meet the little robot drone who accompanies you, I was kind of wondering, like, oh, so I wonder if they just do this whole game 
without any dialogue because you're a cat and I, I haven't seen anything which shows like you know a cat speaking <laughs> to another cat and there are like <laughs> subtitles or anything <laughs> but eventually you know they the, all the robots just start speaking English to each other yeah but the the eco comparison just got me thinking because there really wasn't dialogue in that game either but like it, it gave you enough to start like inferring things that happened or maybe not nothing definitive but you could start formulating theories about what was going on in this world and I think like there was a lot of potential for that here too as well if they had just not had the robots or Maybe just not the dialogue. The robots seem kind of central to the story taking place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how interesting would it be to have a game where, you, well, I mean, we're back to time on Frog Island, where you and the main inhabitants of this city don't speak the same language. So if the robots just sort of like, blah, 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 <laughs> and it was like, you know, uh, 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 weird little uh, ASCII text that popped up out of their head and you're a cat. So you don't understand, of course yeah. um, you would have to find a way to sort of, uh, you know, infer uh, what is being asked of you and what the mission or the objective is. Yeah. But uh, you know, the game uh, doesn't go that way. It is uh, the, the robots start talking to you in English. Um, mm-hmm. And despite that, you're a cat and you still somehow figure it out. You still understand. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. totally sure how that was supposed to work, but yeah, whatever. I'll let it go. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it occurred to me they're talking to me, the player. They're not necessarily talking to the cat. So, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I get what they're going for, but yeah, it would be would have been interesting, and certainly would have felt a little bit more like a, hopefully a, a bit of an audacious experiment uh, to do a, um, an entire game where as a cat you don't understand anything that's happening around you, but you still hopefully do the right stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's too bad. I, I really think like this team, just for having played this game, I, I think they probably could have pulled it off. Because in general, the like, I noticed the environmental design was very good. You, typically, you you kind of were subconsciously guided towards the next uh, place you're supposed to go, or at least that's mm-hmm. that was my experience. So I feel like they could have done an experience like Eco, where there's just not a lot of explicit sort of direction or exposition. Yeah, but I don't know. Maybe they felt like that wouldn't have been as successful with people. It seemed like they really wanted to get this cat game out to as, as many people as possible. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I mean, yeah, and I don't know what sort of the timeline is for realizing that because as soon as the first trailer for this thing popped up a couple of years ago, um, it, it has been a pretty big obsession on the internet and, and sort of hotly desired by a lot of gamers. It was up to this point, it was the most, uh, what the most wish listed game on steam, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <clears throat> So yeah, I don't know if at that point they were like, we need to make this as utilitarian and as accessible as humanly possible. Yeah, um, it seems unlikely that that would have dictated sort of the the scope and scale of the game from that point forward. But yeah, it clearly was not going to come out and be a little thing that about ten people played. <laughs> yeah, oh man, I just get get to thinking like, oh, what if they had just released this cat game with you know no dialogue and you were just sort of. Uh, I don't, I don't know how they would have to present objectives at that point, but if they had managed to pull it off where you're just, you know, a cat that doesn't speak English and you just do things because it makes sense that that's the thing you should be doing at that given point, that yeah. could have been really like a transcendent experience. <laughs> I um I had a little moment and I guess I, I was not sort of like uh, consciously sort of processing it until you pointed that out, th- this out, but uh, early in the game before you meet your little drone companion you are exploring a little bit. And at one point I walked up to a door like, you know, if I was a human, I would just turn the handle and open the door, (laughs) but you're a cat. So that's not an option. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I had a little like, Oh wait, I can't open the door because I'm a cat. (laughs) Despite pushing every button on my controller to find out like, what's the button that makes the door open. Um, uh, And I had to look around and like climb on a thing and jump over a thing and go through a window or a crack in the, in the cement or whatever to try to find my way into the building. And I'm like, what if the entire game was cool little moments like that, where your instinct as a player is to do human stuff, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. but you have to sort of approach and view the whole world from a cat's perspective where you don't have opposable thumbs and you can't open doors and things like that. So, yeah, I think there's probably the, you know, the acorn of a really unique untitled cat game in that. But I don't uh, yeah. I don't think this is not that game, clearly. Yeah. 
it got i mean i think it was pretty successful in in a few like sort of along those lines because by the end of it i was definitely thinking more or like i was approaching the platforming and sort of those types of puzzles with like the cat's ability set in mind yeah because i would would think like oh you know maybe i can climb up on all these like air conditioning units or whatever that are sticking out of the walls and you know run across this uh like scaffolding uh in a way that would like you wouldn't even consider and even if it was something like assassin's creed where you're already parkouring (laughs) over everything in the environment right there are just specific ways you can move as a cat uh that you could not really do as a a human like a full-size human yeah so that was an interesting trick that that pulled off but uh, i was just thinking like wow what if they could have taken it to the next level like what what other sort of cat specific things uh could they have included yeah um i mean that said though i mean i i i did sort of find myself kind of uh, um growing an appreciation for some of the relationships i had with some of the robots and and some of their little personality quirks and and things yeah. like that I, I was uh i was into it i um i never thought it was uh i never really thought it was too much um no i i ended up really enjoying it it was just not uh exactly the game i was expecting when i right. first started it up yeah I think that's um, I think that's a smart way to approach it because I I intentionally had not read a hundred reviews and not watched every trailer and was sort of like uh, you know I'm gonna I'm into this thing I'm excited about it I hope it's good uh, maybe I'm I'm better off just sort of getting into it as quickly as I can and I wanted to play it kind of first weekend because I knew once sort of the internet got to it <laughs> like it was going to be everywhere <laughs> and it has been um, uh, so yeah I feel like uh, um hopefully others have had the experience of kind of jumping into it somewhat blind. Yeah. 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 And and here we are on this podcast to take that opportunity away from you. <laughs> well, I like we've left uh, enough <laughs> no, surprises intact. Being a smart ass, but uh, yeah. Um, I, I do love that the internet has found kind of fun ways to mod stray in <laughs> that there, the, what was the one that I liked was the um, heavy rain one where, where instead of the, cat the the meow button saying meow as the cat it does jason jason <laughs> great um so we yeah. needed yeah exactly um so heavy rain players will i don't know if you'll appreciate that but we'll hopefully find the humor in that yeah. um yeah and at some point today i read that somebody had modded it so the cat turns into cj from uh, san andreas <laughs> great that auto great <laughs> walking on all fours which is a weird thing um <laughs> But uh um, that's just bizarre. Yeah, it it's super bizarre. Um but yeah, the the internet is does doing what the internet does. <laughs> yeah. Well yeah. Always so glad when uh when a game comes out on PC and uh just the modders go to town with it. It's good. <laughs> yeah. But I had a really good time with it. I mean I like it. I'm I'm I think I'm a hair away from finishing it. You did finish it, you said. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, I've, uh, I found the experience to be very, uh, very satisfying. I, I was, I was quite into it over the weekend. Yeah, that no, was good. Well, well, hopefully this is, um, we get more cool stray games and maybe they can be, a, um, a little more experimental, a little more funky in the future. I don't need a sequel to this. I mean, maybe no. they can make another, somebody else can make another cat game, but it was such a cool idea. They should, uh, I would like to see what else they come up with rather than just making cat games for the next decade or whatever. No, I'll play all the cat games. All right, yeah. Stray to the zebra. <laughs> See, I want a zebra game. <laughs> I don't even know what that would be like. <laughs> I was wondering if you, and I think you, you're a fan of this game. What was that game where you were like a Pomeranian in Tokyo? Oh, Tokyo Jungle. Yeah, when's Tokyo uh, Jungle. when's that getting a re-release? Um, I was trying to think of like how many games are out there where you play as play as the animal. Like you have a lot of like games where you have a companion you have a dog or a cat or whatever in a video game but sure uh, in in general there are not a lot of uh gaming experiences that sort of come to mind where you are the critter where you are the sidekick yeah or you know perhaps you're you're an animal but you like walk on hind legs and yeah, speak in yeah. full sentences and, and that sort of thing <laughs> yeah it's the anthropomorphic right isn't that the word yeah 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 which brings me but, to this other game that i played this week no oh masterful segue there yeah. called X Zodiac or EX Zodiac. I'm not totally sure. <laughs> this is, uh, I've kind of had my eye on this for a while. 
because you see screenshots or video of it, and immediately you're just like, well, that's Star Fox. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, there's no question that's what they are going for. Um, so this came out on Steam Early Access, and I downloaded it, and I started it up, and I was like, yeah, this is just uh, somebody made their own version of Star Fox. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If, geez, if you were like, Randy, look up screenshots of this. Tell me what game immediately comes to mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, Star Fox. And it's really interesting because it is mostly evocative of Star Fox, like the original on the Super NES, as opposed to Star Fox 64, which I feel like is the more popular version. But just like from a, a visuals standpoint and just sort of how the levels unfold and even down to like the whenever characters talk to you on the radio, they do the little Star Fox like <laughs> voice or whatever. <laughs> It is very much in the mold of uh, the original Star Fox, which I appreciated. And it's very cool seeing sort of a modern, I guess, take on it. I, I don't even know how much of a take of it is at this point, since it, it really feels like it is just Star Fox again. <laughs> but like playing Star Fox back on the Super Nintendo, it it was, you know, may have been a, a technical marvel, but it didn't run the the best uh, especially compared to, you know, more modern uh, games in this genre. So you're talking, you know, whatever resolution TVs were back then, like 3 to 20 pixels, plus it probably got down to the single digits in terms of frame rate. So being able to start this up and have it in full, like, actually, I'm not sure if this runs at, uh, you know, full HD or whatever, because they it's still very pixely. But having it, you know, a game that looks and plays like Star Fox running 60 frames per second is kind of miraculous. <laughs> so, I mean, I was interested in it just for sort of that angle. Like, what would it be like if you could play Star Fox, but it ran well? Yeah. But also just, I was curious to see what it would be like if somebody made a Star Fox game in 2022. And for the most part, it is pretty standard Star Fox fare. Like, you, you've got your little fighter plane, which we swear is not the ship from Star Fox. Like, they <laughs> made just enough alterations uh, to, you know, throw Nintendo's legal team off the scent. But you're flying down this corridor um, that is filled with still very low polygon sort of obstacles and enemies. It still very much has that old Star Fox Super FX aesthetic. Um, and you've got got your lasers they've added sort of lock-on missiles like uh i think you had some kind of lock-on laser in star fox 64 but it reminded me very much of like res or child of eden like that type of game where you're doing the same kind of thing but you're you know you're locking on to stuff yeah and then you've got your boost and break uh just very traditional star fox stuff so immediately felt very familiar um, and then it throws a bunch of levels at you. Uh, at the end of each one, you fight a big boss, and then it gives you a rank based on, you know, how many enemies you shot down and how much damage you took. So just instantly, just very familiar. Cool. Well, in a good way or or, or in, a, in a way that sort of feels like, oh, somebody's going to get sued. Well, so I'm a little worried about these guys. I just, <laughs> it seems like they've not drawn too much attention from Nintendo at this point. And it does feel like it's different enough that uh, it's not like the the main character looks like Fox McCloud or whatever. Like it's right, a, a totally yeah. different cast. Um, and so they I'm avoided the, the trap of sort of like calling it Star Dog or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it, you know it is very similar. I think it's good because it's clearly for people who are looking for a new Star Fox game to play. They haven't made one of those in in quite a while. But I found myself wondering after you know going through five or six levels of this. Uh, the ones that are available in early access, it, it at some point it just kind of cuts off and says, like, to be continued. <laughs> Where I was like, well, where's the new stuff? Like, it was fun playing five new Star Fox levels, but it's just more Star Fox. Right. Like, what has been happening in this genre since, I don't know, like 1993 or whenever that game came out? Where, where are all the, the new ideas? Like... Between now and then, Star Fox 2 came out and added a bunch of weird twists into the formula, which did not really reappear in this. Uh, so, I don't know, it, it left me wanting a little bit more. Like, it's fun to play a total nostalgia throwback, 
but I was really hoping that the developer would toss in a few of their own little takes on the different elements of it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's sort of the fine line between, you know, when is a when is a game sort of like a an homage to this thing that has come before and when is it just a copy of it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's got to kind of do something, bring something new to the party, right? <laughs> um it can look and sort of play and feel a bit like a Zelda game, but um yeah, you kind of want it to to be its own thing as well. And hopefully as a developer, that's an aspiration of yours too. You can love Zelda and want to make your own Zelda game, but don't just copy The Legend of Zelda or Star Fox or insert game name here. Right. Because um, it's like, yeah. well, that game already exists and you exactly, be able to yeah. play it for a while. Yep. And Nintendo is just going to shut you down. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, <but> also. <laughs> so, you know, in their defense, it, it is still an early access. I imagine they're adding a few more levels to it and who knows what other kind of changes they're going to be rolling out. But uh, that remains to be seen. Towards the end, there's one level that takes place on uh, on you know, like a, on a motorcycle or like a hover bike. And up until that point, everything has been in the little like Star Fox kind of ship. So even that was just like, oh, wow, this is different. This is kind of cool. I wonder if they're going to take this in, in new directions. But Is this the direction of it? Yeah. Yeah. So like even that was enough to like just mix it up a little bit make it a little more unique. So who knows, maybe they have a bunch of other vehicles up their sleeves. Until then, it is very cool just to see a game like this running, you know, in, in full sort of 2022 fidelity. Yeah. Kind of resurrecting that Star Fox aesthetic. Um, cool. So despite sort of my reservations about there just not being a whole lot of like fresh stuff in the game, it is still a lot of fun. Like the, the levels are good. The shooting is still really satisfying. The bosses I had a lot of fun with. I feel like the bosses are always a little more interesting than just flying down the, the corridor and shooting stuff down. Right. But yeah, it's in, in early access. We'll see how it sort of develops. Hmm. Looking at some of the screenshots, did you ever play the game um, Race the Sun? Have you heard of that? I think I have that, but I have not played it. Yeah. Um, it's been around for a little while. I played it on the Vita, if I remember correctly, but just yeah. Googling it now, it, it appears to be on everything, including iOS and Android. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah, it's kind of an endless runner, but it looks a bit like this, where you're sort of uh, you, every game is you sort of flying a, a mysterious ship in the direction of the sun. And as yeah. the sun oh, sets, you know, it drops behind maybe, the horizon. Maybe I did play that. OK, <laughs> does this sound familiar? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't think there's any combat. There's no boss battles or anything like that. It's more of an endless runner, um, but it's you sort of flying the ship through you know, narrow passageways and knowing when to flip and barrel roll and kind of things like that, avoiding uh, uh, things that get in your way because you can't stop and you have to sort of run to the end very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but it's super arcadey. It's super fun. It's real easy pick up and play and, and very quick sort of play sessions. I had a good time with that game. And as I'm looking at these screenshots and it's sort of like this weird kind of neon 80s aesthetic, <laughs> Race the Sun has a little bit of that vibe too. So that was the first thing that popped into my brain as I was looking at uh, um, Exodiac. Yeah. Huh. You know. And that's a complete yeah. game. That's out. That's been out for a long time. <laughs> uh, it is not in early access. It's in very late access. Um, but uh, it looks like geez, it's two ninety nine dollars on the PlayStation Store. So if anybody wants a thing that sort of pushes some of these buttons, maybe check out Race the Sun. Oh, yeah. Or, or, you know, check out X the Exodiac on Steam. Exodiac. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, not trying to dissuade anybody from I, mean, I have no skin in this game, but <laughs> I did a. Uh, um, yeah, this is the first uh, first thing that I have from my gaming history that mm -hmm. seemed to push these buttons. Yeah, I was like fairly certain you'd, I mean, I thought it was likely that you'd never played a Star Fox game. I thought maybe you might have played Res at some point, but, uh, you know, those are the easiest comparisons to it. Yeah, I have played Res. Um, that developer did another game. Child of Eden. Child of Eden. I played a lot of Child of Eden. Oh, really? Uh, Interesting. And when Child of Eden first came out, it was PlayStation 3, right? They also re-released Res at that point. And, and at that point, I had not previously played Res, but went back to play it again. And yeah, they're both very strange games. Yeah. That's funny that I think about it, because when I played Child of Eden, I had the, kind of the same reaction to playing X Zodiac, where I was like, well, this is just Res. Why did you make Res again? <laughs> Oh, I played Child of Eden first, so yeah, I, think, uh, okay. I probably had a similar experience, but in reverse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's fine. Everybody loves Res or yeah. Child of Eden, depending on what order you play them in. 
but uh, I was I was actually surprised that they hadn't done more with it. I mean, I think the hook with Child of Eden is it was designed to be played with uh, Connect on the Xbox, which I did not have. So, so I was like, okay, I may be missing just all the cool new stuff that uh, you're supposed to get out of having a Connect. Oh, gotcha. As far as I know, there's no Connect support for X Zodiac, so <laughs> probably better that way. That's a bummer. <laughs> is it we, though? We need more Connect games, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, uh, that's something I never expected to hear. <laughs> uh yeah well cool anyway so so if it sounded like i had misgivings about this i still thoroughly recommend if you're a fan of star fox go check it out because like i said it's been a long time since they made a star fox game or at least one that people speak fondly about so you could do it far <laughs> worse than uh spending a little time with x zodiac yeah I mean, how long has that series been dormant i i remember there being a a 3ds game they did a 3ds one and um well, they did a DS one. Sorry, this is getting into it now. Okay. They re-released Star Fox 64 on 3DS, which I think is where I ended up playing most of it. Gotcha. And then they did a Wii U one, which maybe that's all I need to say about that. Ah. Uh, Haven't heard of any few- plans to re-release that for the Switch, so yeah, <laughs> who knows? One of the few um, Wii U games that has not made its way to the Switch, and perhaps for good reason. Yeah, I don't think it was especially well received. Although I remember seeing footage of it when it was coming out, and I thought, well, this doesn't, you know, like, I would play this. Although apparently that wasn't true, because I never played it. Hmm. Maybe if it was all just low poly, and only had four or five colors on the screen, like Exodiac, I would have been more Yeah, good. Embrace the retro. Yeah, nobody wants a super polished, <laughs> like, HD up something or other. Yeah. Um, yeah, make it janky. I mean... I would be into just if they re-released a new version of Star Fox that ran sort of to modern standards. Because even when they they put it on the uh, the Super NES Classic, the little mini console. Oh, yeah. It was just the Super Nintendo version, and it still ran like it did back in 1993 or whenever. <laughs> so, Which I'm, I'm inferring is not great. Not great. I mean, it was a lot less apparent back in 1993. Where sure. he was like, oh, wow, I've never seen a game that looks like this. And you're jumping back into it in, you know, I forgot when that mini console came out. I was like, ah, yes, <laughs> games have come a long way since then. <laughs> All right, we should uh, wrap this thing up, I guess, right? Uh, I think so. I think that's it. All right. If you need any more video game hangover in your brain, you should follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash VG Hangover. And you can always get show notes and links and tell us what you thought about this episode at vghangover.com. Uh, we would love for you to join our backlog attack coming up in August. Uh, pick four games from your backlog and play along with us. We're giving away pri- uh, a, a prize for the most impressive feat of backloggery next month. Um, yeah. So definitely go to vghangover.com for more info on that. Uh, you should hop into our Discord too. We can talk about the games that we've been playing. You can share your backlog strategy with us. You can give us little updates and stuff on the games you're playing. Uh, we will be doing the same. Uh, you can get an invite to our Discord at vghangover.com. Yeah. Uh, please subscribe, rate, and review us on your podcasting app of choice. Uh, it would help us out immensely if you would just tell your friends about the show as well. Yeah. Word of mouth really helps us out attract yeah. new listeners. So we appreciate it. We also like to give thanks again to Saria Lemus this week for our intro and outro music. You can go to pettypanol.bandcamp.com, listen to the rest of her discography, and maybe buy an album or two. Yeah. Uh, we'll be back uh, next week with, uh, we're going to do a summer gaming music show next week. Yeah. Yeah. Those are always fun. So, yeah, should be good. Don't yeah. miss it. What's the rest of this? Okay, we'll be back next week <laughs> until I'm like, where, where am I in the outline? Did I forget something? I've only done it 500 times. I forgot. Uh, we'll be back next week. Until then, this is Randy Dickinson. This is DJ Ross. Thanks so much for listening to Video Game Hangover. Goodbye. Good night. See you.